If you open to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, that's where we'll be. The majority of the lesson. And the lesson is called Not Wisdom. That's what we preach as a rule, not wisdom. Show you what we mean by that. When you start reading 1 Corinthians 2, you realize that the word wisdom appears several times in the text, and it's in the negative, not wisdom. Several times before you start talking about the fact that there is a godly wisdom. And I think that that is instructive to us because we're easily drawn to earthly wisdom, you know. It's about what we're listening for. Uh, I was told about a young man that brought a very powerful lesson um, it's a bit unusual, I guess. Uh, the, the, the elders were kind of shocked at the wisdom of the young man. <laughs> but, uh, he said, you, you know, first you have to know, you know who, who or what are you listening to, but more importantly, what are you listening for? And that's true. That, that's, that's absolutely true. That's correct. And it brings you to 1 Corinthians 2. Where Paul said, for example, in the first two verses, And I, when I came to you, brothers, did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom. For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. It's the first thing that he said was he came to Corinth and he was preaching the gospel in Corinth for the first time. They'd heard maybe something, but the first time you really have an apostle there teaching the gospel, preaching among them is Paul, and he came there to preach the gospel. And when he came, he said he came proclaiming the testimony of God, but not with lofty speech or wisdom. That's why we say not wisdom. When he came to Corinth, he came not with wisdom, not with lofty speech or with wisdom. That's important to understand that in Corinth, of course, they had a long tradition of wisdom, wisdom speakers, you know, philosophy and uh, sophistry and all the different rhetoricians, you know, public speaking was very important to them. Uh, People standing up, giving speeches, you know, re reasoning through things. This pursuit of wisdom was a big deal to Corinth. And um, all the Greek city-states, you know, Athens, no different. They, they all really valued and prized this. And you can see it in Acts 17 when Paul arrives and speaks. You see that attitude among them. So what was it that they were looking for to begin with? Well, as a rule, they looked for lofty speech and wisdom. If they were going to listen to somebody teach in public, they wanted that somebody to be listenable. <laughs> they wanted the, you know, somebody with a, a soaring pitch, you know, a booming register, a dynamic speaker, you know, with a, a wide vocabulary uh, you know, thought-provoking illustrations. You know, this is what they're looking for. And it's precisely what Paul did not do. <laughs> I did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom. Why not? Well, on the one hand, we say he's not a good speaker. He he talks about the fact that he is under attack in other places. You can read in the second letter especially how they said his, 
You know, his letters are weighty, but his personal presence is contemptible. His speech, you know, of no account. That he's not a good public speaker, which some have said is him demurring, uh, just being humble, but actually it's obvious that he was a good public speaker since he was teaching the people of Israel, et cetera, et cetera. You know, we're not there. We don't hear his tone of voice. We don't hear what he's saying. But the reason uh, that he does it according to what he himself said in the Bible at 1 Corinthians 2, verse 2, is, I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. That word decided is judged. He made a judgment as in he determined ahead of time before going to Corinth that he was not going to go to Corinth and be like the other public speakers at Corinth. I decided ahead of time that I wouldn't know anything except Jesus. And that is what you need, <laughs> right? That is the way that the pulpit of the Lord should be. I decided ahead of time that I don't know anything but Jesus. We are not here to talk about my opinions. We are not here to talk about science, archaeology, history, tradition. Forget it. Determine before you stand up that you don't know anything but Jesus. No lofty speech, no wisdom. And you know, this is true for all of us, whether you, you are a public speaker or not. It's your words with those who are around you as you reach out to them and talk to them about Jesus and talk to them about the gospel. You know, it's not to be lofty speech or wisdom. You don't need to know those things. You need to know Jesus. Know the Bible. Yes, he said, I came and I wasn't lofty because I decided not to be that way. And verse 3 continues, I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling. And my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. So he spoke words in weakness, in fear, in trembling. You know, again, I think people are looking for speakers who are dynamic, who are smiling the whole time. Um, and there are some guys that are kind of frightening, you know, that I don't know how you smile for 45 minutes straight, but some of these guys do it. <laughs> I remember the old days of the Muppets and the Sesame Street when there was a commentator named Guy Smiley. I think of him sometimes. <laughs> but, you know, where's the weakness, the fear, the much trembling? You put out a want ad for a gospel preacher. Does it include weakness, fear, and trembling? Plausible words of wisdom, he said, is not what I used. Not using plausible words of wisdom. As in, it's, this doesn't have to be believable in human terms. What we're proclaiming is the word of God. And for some people, that's not believable. And we make no apologies for that. It is God's word. And he is right, and it should be believed. And if you don't believe it, you will be lost. But I'm not going to apologize for it. I'm not going to defend it. God doesn't need to be defended. Here's what he says. No plausible words of human wisdom, but rather... His speech and message were in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. How so? Well, by not being plausible words of wisdom, 
by not being lofty speech, by not consisting of anything but Jesus Christ and him crucified. He demonstrated the spirit and power in this way. Do we want to have spirit in our teaching? Yes, we do, but this is how you do it. Do you want the teaching to be powerful? Yes. But what is powerful? Is it how they talk, how they look, how they reason with you? Or is it the word front and center in its fullness, in its glory? What demonstrates the spirit? What demonstrates the power of God? He said, not wisdom, not lofty speech, not anything but Jesus and him crucified, not plausible, and not the wisdom of men, so that your faith, verse 5, may not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. When we teach the Bible and the Bible only, right? We are avoiding the wisdom of men. We're avoiding plausible words. We're avoiding rhetoric, pizzazz, if you will, so that faith is established through the word. Faith is in the word of God, not the wisdom of men. The word of God is the power of God to salvation, Romans 1.16. For everyone who believes... Your faith, your belief, is not in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. That kind of teaching is the thing that is actually powerful, though it may not seem to be powerful and may not capture the attention unless you, really inter you are really interested in spiritual things. And yet... He admits in the sixth verse, Yet among the mature we do impart wisdom. Although it's not a wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age who are doomed to pass away. But we impart a secret and hidden wisdom which God decreed before the ages for our glory. But he says, among the mature, we do impart wisdom. So now we get down to it. It's not that God's word isn't wisdom or that the Bible doesn't make you wise. It is wisdom and it does make you wise, but only if you are mature. Only if you allow it to do so. If you will listen to it, if you will heed what it says. And this idea of maturity, you can hold your place at 1 Corinthians 2 if you like, but I will look over at Hebrews 5, verses 11 to 14, where Paul has to break the thought. He began talking about Melchizedek and the symbol of, that Melchizedek is of Jesus, the way in which Melchizedek symbolizes Jesus. And before he continues on that illustration, he says, about this, we have much to say, Hebrews 5, 11, and it's hard to explain since you have become dull of hearing. <laughs> Not that it's hard to explain in and of itself, not that it's too difficult to understand or to follow, but that what makes it hard to explain is that you have become dull of hearing. It's hard to explain it to you. That's what he's saying. And though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the basic principles of the oracles of God. By this time, you ought to be teachers. By what time? You know, the only time frame that the gospel gives about maturity 
um, is, in, is found in Acts 19 and Acts 20, where Paul first uh, stumbles upon Ephesus in Acts 19. And they are first baptized in the name of Jesus Christ in Acts 19 by Paul, which you can read about. They had learned about John the Baptist through Apollos, and that was all accurate and good, but they hadn't finished the gospel. They hadn't learned about baptism in the name of Jesus Christ for forgiveness of sins. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of Christ. And there was a church at Ephesus, and he left a young man, Timothy, at Ephesus to preach. And he sent a letter to Timothy. The first letter to Timothy in the third chapter provides for us and for Timothy, a record of what qualifies men to serve as elders. Among the qualities is they should not be neophytes, that is, new converts. And in Acts 20, when Paul is traveling nearby, Miletus, he summons to himself the elders of Ephesus, how long had it been? Mm, about three and a half years. About three and a half years. From the time that they obeyed the gospel till the time they were no longer neophytes, but able to teach the word of God was about three and a half years. By this time, you ought to be teachers but have need of someone to teach you again the basic principles of the oracles of God. How much time is it? It's not that much time. We should understand the Bible. It's not that there aren't things hard to understand, and it's not that there aren't things that take some time and, and require some study. There are. Or things that are complex. Yes, there are. But it's nothing that you can't do. In the space of some years, I'm not saying that the Bible binds three and a half years. I'm saying we know for sure that that's about the time frame from the testimony of the book of the Acts. It gives you an example of how long to expect, which is very different from what, you know, the Brotherhood books and commentaries say that it takes 30 years to become an elder. Well, they would say that because they don't want you to have elders because they don't like being told what to do. <laughs> but that's not biblical. This is biblical. And we ought to hold ourselves to a higher standard. If you've been a Christian for 10 years and you don't know, you are immature. You are overdue. He said to them, you need milk and not solid food. For everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness. He is an infant. Yep, the infant is the one that lives on milk. <laughs> Saying that is unskilled. Now Peter had said to them, you know, as newborn babes desire the pure milk of the word. It's true when you are first a Christian, when you have obeyed the gospel, when you are in those early years learning and growing. You do desire the milk, and nobody holds you at fault for that. When you first obey the gospel, you don't know everything. We're, that, you're not at fault for that. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about that person who's become an adult. They shouldn't be unskilled in the word of righteousness. Rather, solid food is for the mature, those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. The mature person has powers of discernment in the gospel. They come from constant practice. We live the life of God, Romans 12, 1 and 2. We present our bodies a living sacrifice to him, holy, acceptable to God, the reasonable service. We, we constantly make the distinction between right and wrong, between clean and unclean, good and evil. And you know, the inverse of this is also true and should be taken to heart that when it seems like everything is gray, I don't know what is right. I can't tell what is right. 
Or as some of them have said, I wouldn't be so bold as to say that I knew for certain anything from the Bible. That means you are not Hebrews 5.14, trained to distinguish good from evil. If you cannot tell the difference between good and evil, you are immature. You should not be a teacher. You have need to be taught again the elementary principles. If everything seems gray, and I don't know the truth, and I don't think it can be known, you are wrong. You are far away from where you should be as a Christian. It's not like that. shouldn't be like that. But we go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. He said there, Among the mature we do impart wisdom, though not a wisdom of this age or the rulers of this age who are doomed to pass away. We impart a secret, a hidden wisdom from God, a wisdom which God decreed before the ages, For our glory, none of the rulers of this age understood this, verse 9 continues, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, what no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined, what God has prepared for those who love him. That's talking about now. That's talking about us. People think that's about heaven. No, it's about the kingdom of God. And we have a call out here to Ephesians 3 which also we will read. Ephesians 3, verses 1 through 5, and also verses 8 through 11. But regarding this wisdom, this hidden wisdom, did you consider what Paul said to them at Ephesus? For this reason, I, Paul, am a prisoner for Christ Jesus on behalf of you Gentiles, assuming you've heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you, how the mystery was made known to me by revelation. He's been given a stewardship, meaning he's been entrusted with something. What is it? It's the gospel made known to him by revelation which he also said in Galatians 1, it was made known by direct revelation of Jesus Christ. Remember that? The stewardship of God's grace given to me for you is this mystery made known by means of revelation. Okay, so how does it get out of Paul's head and into our ears? Well, it's Ephesians 3 and verse 3, as I have written briefly. You know, the closing of Hebrews in the 13th chapter says, bear with this brief word of exhortation. (laughs) So if you're wondering about Paul's idea of brief, you know, Hebrews 13 calls the letter of Hebrews brief. He said, I've written before briefly, when you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ. So it gets out of his head into our ears by the writing. He wrote it down. He intends for us to hear this. He intends for us to read it. And it says, when you read it, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ. See, people love that mystery. Ah, see, it is a mystery. You can't understand it. No, 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 not so fast. It is a mystery that is given to Paul by revelation, a mystery to this world and this age, but now he has written. And when he has written it, we can read it. And when we read it, we perceive his insight into the mystery. What does that mean? It means it's no longer mysterious, friend. You understand it. Same as he. This mystery of Christ, Ephesians 3, and verse 5, was not made known to the sons of men in other generations, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. And I understand that he's talking specifically about the inclusion of the Gentiles. 
I understand that. That's not lost on me. But what does the inclusion of the Gentiles mean? It means the fulfillment of the promise to Abraham that in you all nations, that is all Gentiles, will be blessed. It's not about Jew and Gentile. It's about the whole world's salvation. So no, I'm not willing to limit it to a discussion of Jew and Gentile. Those are the same people who think Acts 15 was a public debate. That's not true at all. This is about the salvation that God had for us and for all nations in Christ. It was not made known in other generations among the sons of men, but it has been revealed today through the apostles and the prophets. That's what we were reading over there in 1 Corinthians 2, where he said, a wisdom hidden in God, a wisdom which the rulers of this age did not know. If they had known, they wouldn't have crucified the Son of Glory, but rather things that eye has not seen, ear has not heard. That's what we're talking about. Now, in the end here in Ephesians 3, verse 8, skip down a bit. He said, to me, though I'm the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things so that through the church the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. Paul said, Though I'm the least of all the saints, it was granted that by my mouth this should be revealed, that by my pen this should be written down. And it brings to light for everyone the mystery that had been hidden for ages in God. Now there's light. It's no longer mysterious. You see that? And the result, verse 10, is so that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known. We have the ball, is what that means. Paul's gone, you know that, right? Miracles are gone. They don't, we don't, that doesn't get done anymore. There's nothing, no sign to attest to this. It's the Bible. This is the power of God to salvation. This is the great sign. People want a great sign. Here's your great sign. Read this book. There's nothing like it. Man couldn't possibly have come up with this. Look what's in it. But see, we the church, we have the ball. The manifold wisdom of God is to be made known by us in this world, among the authorities and wherever else. That's why we're talking the way that we are in Hebrews 5. Like, man, you, you, you got to get off <laughs> you got to get off and on your way to maturity don't stall out at the beginning here because you need to understand the wisdom of god so that you can make it known it's up to the church to be teaching in this world to be proclaiming the gospel of jesus among the lost even to authorities and powers this was according, verse 11, to the eternal purpose that he has realized in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Eternal as in from the beginning of time, he has intended to bring this about. And indeed, he has done so as of the writing of Paul. He has done it. It is realized. It's true. In the coming of Christ and the fulfillment of all these things and the writing of this scripture, God is realizing his purpose. And we are that purpose. The church is here. We are that church. We are the Gentiles, the nations who are blessed in the faith of Abraham. And we're the ones who are to lay this out. Now, in closing, at 1 Corinthians 2, at verse 12, he said, Now we've received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might understand all things freely given to us by God. We haven't the spirit of the world. We have the spirit from God. Why? to understand the things freely given us by God? The Bible says you can understand it. Paul said when you read, you understand. Paul said the church makes known the manifold wisdom of God. 1 Corinthians 2, uh, let's see. 
Yes, verse 13. We impart this wisdom in words not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Spirit, interpreting spiritual truths to those who are spiritual in their mind. Again, it's not human wisdom. It's biblical wisdom, inspired. And the 13th, I'm sorry, the 14th verse records this. The natural person doesn't accept the things of the Spirit of God. They are folly to him. He's not, under, he's not able to understand them because they're spiritually discerned, and he won't use his spirit to discern things, see? Natural person doesn't accept it. But do we accept it, or does it have to be plausible? Does it have to be palatable? Does it have to be convincing? Does it have to be brought with loftiness of speech, with great swelling words? The natural person doesn't accept these things. They're folly to him. Why, this is foolhardy. This is never going anywhere. You'll convince nobody. That's the natural person talking. And you know what? I never will convince anybody. That's true. I hope so anyway. I hope that I never convince a single person. Let the Bible convince you. Let the Bible convince you to be a Christian. Let God's word convince you to obey the gospel. Yes, he says, who has understand the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? Verse 16, as some would say, well, you think that you know. Ah, but the answer to that is this. We have the mind of Christ. We have the mind of Christ. No, we don't understand the mind of the Lord to give him instructions. That's not what we're trying to do. What we're saying is, though, we know what we need to know. We know what God wants us to know. We have the mind of Christ. And that's the mind of 1 Corinthians 1, verse 10, which says, I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all agree that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind, even the same judgment. What's happening today is brethren and preachers across the land say that's not possible. It can't be done. You can't have agreement in the scriptures. You can't understand the Bible alike. You can't know. That's what they say. They seem very sure that you can't be sure. You know what I mean? They just know that you can't know. Do you see the folly of this? It's like when the devil said to Mother Eve, did God say you can't eat of the tree? No, no. Uh, or, you know, well, yeah, he said we can't eat of the tree because we'll die. And he said, oh, you won't die. He said you can't eat of the tree because he knows in the day you eat of it, you'll be like him. How's that like this? Well, because he's telling you that he knows. He's telling you that he knows that you don't know. He's very sure that Eve shouldn't be sure. He knows that Eve doesn't know and Eve can't know, that it can't be known. It's just the devil's lie. It always has been. That's all it is. The Bible says, in the name of Jesus Christ, let all of you agree. Let there be no divisions. Be united in the same mind. We have the mind of Christ. Be united in the same mind and the same judgment. Yes, people think that's not possible, but actually those would be plausible words of human wisdom. And that's not what we speak. We speak the word of God and its power to save. The 
They think that's not possible. Can I submit to you that resurrection from the dead is not possible? <laughs> but Jesus did it. God did it because what is impossible with man is possible with God. Is anything too hard for God? Not so. My confidence about understanding the Bible, you understand this, the confidence about understanding the Bible and being able to attain a Bible unity is not based in myself or in you or in, in my brethren, right? My confidence is in God who can speak a word that we can understand. My confidence is in God who caused Paul to write these things that so plainly tell us to be united, to have the mind of Christ, that when we read, we can understand, that we can reach maturity in a reasonably attainable amount of time. I believe him when he says that. That's where the confidence is coming from. It's the same with our salvation. Can you be saved? Are you heaven-bound? I believe you can be saved, and I believe you are heaven-bound. That's why you are here, and that's why you're so dear to me. But I believe that not because you're so great, not because I'm so great, but because God is so great. He can save, and he said that he would. He didn't speak his word into a vacuum. He didn't speak so that nobody would obey. He didn't send his son Jesus to die for nobody to make it. That's not how it is. That's not the kind of God that we serve. My confidence in our salvation is not in us. It's in God who saves. Can he do it or can't he? Is anything too hard for him? No. I believe him when he says it. That's what he said, and I believe that. I think you do too. So no, it's not wisdom. It's not human wisdom. It's not plausible but it is God's wisdom. We must hold it. We must demand it. Today, are you a Christian? Have you put Jesus on in baptism? Have you fulfilled the things that you read plainly from the scriptures for yourself? And if not, let's have some time to talk. Let's sit down and open those passages together and look at it, hear what God says and what God wants us to do. If today you have not obeyed the gospel. It's time to do so. We have water prepared that you might be baptized in the name of Christ for forgiveness of sins. Today, are you a Christian who hasn't lived right? Repent, make it right with God. Come back to the faith that you departed from. If you need the prayers of the saints, if you need to be baptized, let the need be known by coming to the front while we stand, while we sing the song selected. <laughs>